This is my F150 5.4 3 valve lariat. I bought it with a broken motor as a cheap truck project. So this time on Backshed, we're fixing the dreaded cam phases, cam chains, and giving it a budget makeover. Stick around and take a look. So this one's something different for me. I'm used to dealing with 70s, 60s-ish cars. But I'm also an F-Series pickup tragic, and I saw this cheap F-Truck. So we're going to pick up an 03, I think, uh, F-150. In the States, probably not even worth the fuel money to go and pick it up. But over here, they're still worth a fair bit. So it'll, it's a seven hour round trip. Uh, but like I say, over here, it's worth it. Did you ever look at your nav man? And go like, an hour 42. Challenge accepted. That was different, but anyway, they're cleaning out some storage yards at the airport, and this was in one of them. So, I've got a long way to go, so we won't go around it right now. She'll come up all right. Let's get home. So this is my cheap truck project. Doesn't look too bad from a distance, but she's got a lot of K's on it. And she's a little bit rough around the edges. And you American guys, this is the bit that'll blow you out. The steering wheel's on this side, and that's why they're not cheap over here. It takes an awful lot of money to import these guys back when they were new and flick the steering wheel from that side to that side. I say flick. But it ain't that easy. But she's had a fairly hard life. She's a bit messy. A bit torn up in the front. The steering wheel. Just generally grubby. Oh, a bit of shit going on there. And there. She was a work truck, so in the back's not that bad. The front has all the wear. That's another reason I wanted to try and get this thing going again. It's been parked for a couple of years with a suspected broken motor, but I want to figure out exactly how broken that motor is. It's pretty decent in some spots. Good rubber, good wheels, but I think I'll do something with them. They're not staying like that. But I guess it all comes down to what I've got to do with the motor. Memory for the power seats is on the passenger side, because if you remember, that's the driver's seat originally and they remanufacture the dash bonnet pull still on this side eighth month 03 and this is the 5.4 what's called a modular motor this is a three valve with the dreaded cam phases these have got, and you can see someone's been in here before, everything's marked. The injectors are marked. The coil packs are marked. So I'd say we're in for a, a bit of fun. That's alright, I'm up for it. It's too good to throw away. So we'll see where we head with this one. Got an automatic closing bonnet too. So when I first went to pick him up, we did actually get it to run. It took that much whining, basically flattened the jump pack, but it had been sitting for quite some time. And now that I've got a new battery in it, hang on, I'll shut that door. Storage jar. Have a look at that. She's earned the right to get repaired. She's done the hard yards. But it does actually start with a new battery, so... I'll just crank him over and we'll have a look, but I, th I think he's on about three cylinders. Oh, here we go. Yep. 
Like it is really, really rough. And to try and, and to try and figure out which cylinders we're running, I basically just unplugged the injectors. dies off worse so that injector is running that's all I was doing but when I went to unplug this side none of them made any difference not one of them makes any difference whatsoever and listen to that noise get to that in a minute so I'm not sure how well you could hear me when that was running but essentially these injectors are running you unplug them the engine got worse hard to believe it got worse but it did but this side made absolutely no difference not one of those cylinders is running now if it's a carbureted engine you basically just start working on the cylinders that weren't running is it spark is it this is it that however I think this one's gone into fail safe mode and when it's running, if it's in fail safe mode, it'll come up here. That sounds to me like a failed cam phaser. And I, I can't really hear over the rough exhaust note, but I'm wondering if I can hear a knocking as well. So if I just reach in and grab the, the throttle with my hand and go underneath have a listen to this you that little knock so I think the first thing that needs to happen is I'm going to get a scan tool on that maybe try and get it out of fail safe mode because if I can get it out of fail safe mode and the idle cleans up a little bit that will give me a better idea of actually what the problem is is it running on all eight when fail safe mode is turned off and am I just hearing a big end knock which I think a big end knock might actually send it into fail safe so it might all be tangled in there together First thing to try and reset the fail safe is I'll disconnect the battery and connect those terminals together for 10 minutes. So I reckon that can reset that fail safe. And you guys in the States, this is probably your bread and butter to you guys. These are everywhere and everyone probably knows how to diagnose what I'm hearing there, but not so much out here. Very uncommon. As I said, they were really expensive because of the conversion. But I do know that cam phases are really issue with these. Um, and again, could that be sending it into fail safe? I don't know. I want to try and reset the thing, see if those cylinders improve once it's out of fail safe mode. Uh, and then at least it might give me an idea are we dealing with a big end knock and just pull it? Are we dealing with cam phases? To be honest, with 480,000 or, or just over 300,000 miles. I'll probably pull it anyway, but I just want to see where I'm starting. So I'm going to connect them together. I'm just going to get some vice grips and clamp them together. Apparently clamping these together, I might actually take that out all together so it doesn't bounce back on the terminal. As I say, apparently clamping these together is one way of resetting the fail safe. I guess we'll see. Hopefully, 10 minutes starting now. What time is it? It's 4.30. Right, I'll see you at 20 to 5. 20 to 5, it's almost beer time. That'll only take 10 minutes, surely. So that's 10 minutes. And I'm going to quickly chuck the battery in, hit the key and see what it does. If it takes it out of fail safe mode, what I'm looking for is an improved idle. If it does nothing, then we'll get a scan tool on it, clear some codes, and do that again. Why not clear the codes first? Because I want to find out, is it fail safe? If I cleared codes and fail safe at the same time, you don't actually know which one 
improve the idle. So I want to do it step by step. That's the way my simple brain is telling me to do it. A very simple little brain. got a cheap little reader just goes in the OBD2 port we'll see what we can find that door chime is going to drive me nuts seven pending I've got to get something to write these down there's a lot okay so we've got basically double O uh, 0010, 0020, well you can see the rest, 135, 155, 355, 443 and 446, let's find out what they are, so 10, uh, A, camshaft, position, actuator, open circuit, bank 1, who to thunk it, so 20, uh, same thing, bank 2, 135, O2 sensor, heater circuit, bank 1, sensor 1, to 55, same again, bank 2, 355 now, ignition coil E, primary, secondary circuit, 443, evaporative emission system purge control valve circuit, not writing all that evap, and 6, Evaporative emission system vent control circuit. Right, let's clear them all. All seven. Let's see what comes back up. I'll go out on the limb and say it will make absolutely no difference to any of it, but let's do it anyway. Okay, codes are cleared. Clamp the, the terminals back together for another 10 minutes. See what it does this time. See if it improves the order. So that that is no made no difference at all so all the codes are back instantly the noise is still there I actually just tried to bring the revs up a little so I could hear if that was a rod knock at the bottom of the motor and it went straight into fail safe mode again on the dash and actually dropped more cylinders so it was running better until I tried to bring the idle up and then it's it's um, gone back into fail safe mode again. I don't think I'm going to dick around. I think I'm just going to pull the motor, pull it down with 482,000 kilometers on it. What's the worst that could happen? We put some rings and bearings through it, some new timing chains, lock out the cam phases so they're not an issue anymore and chuck it back in. Let's do that. So it took him out of fail safe again. Move them over on the concrete and start getting this motor out. I've done this once before with a, an F250 um, with the 7.3 diesel. Bought a truck with a broken motor, pulled the motor, repaired it, or had it repaired. That one was a full re engine rebuild, and then fitted it back in. And they're quite complex with the wiring and that sort of thing. So what I tend to do is get yourself a notepad and literally write down the order of things that are, are removed. I just moved him over and I think this has confirmed what I was thinking. She 
She's knocking pretty bad. I think that'll do a 482. So it's actually a couple of days later and I haven't pulled it out. I had to go back to work for a couple of days but that might have worked in my favour. Because just for a change, I think I'm going to slow down on this one and not just rip it. The more I think about that knocking, the more I'm thinking, could that just be the phaser? When they come apart, there's a spring internally in the cam phaser. And when that spring fails, the internals of the cam phaser can actually shudder about and knock. Is that the knock I'm hearing? Because when you think about the phasers bolted to the cam, which is torqued down to the head, so it could be giving me that low knocking sound, but the whole time be a failed phaser. Anyway, so I'm just going to slow down. We'll knock this cover off and see what the phaser looks like and go from there. So I'm going to pull this rocket cover because the cam phaser is actually in there underneath the cover. And that's the cam phaser solenoid. So we'll undo all the wiring, these little bolts here. And then just lift that cover off and just see if we can see the cam phaser coming apart or whatnot. See if something's really obvious. And we'll start undoing a few of these rocket cover bolts. There's uh, one, two, 70. There's 70 of them. Precisely 70. There's a lot, is what I'm saying. There's a lot. So I'm just undoing the rocket cover at the back there. And see that plate? That's where the steering shaft came through. Because if you remember I was saying they get converted from left hand drive to right hand drive. And there's the brake booster. And if you look there, there's the recess for the factory brake booster. So that plate there has obviously been custom made to run the aircon on this side. And then shifted the steering shaft and the brake booster to this side. I've seen some really, really bad older conversions where they've cut sections out of the firewall and that sort of thing. But that's just a, pl a plate that's been bolted in. That's another plate that's been made to cover the steering and the brake booster holes, which is pretty neat and tidy. And you sort of forget about how much effort actually goes into it. All the brake lines would have been here. Well, they're not. They're there. So they've had to remake all the brake lines from this side, move the booster, move the whole steering column, the steering shaft, you can see just down there. That's why over here you see one of these running around. You know they're an enthusiast because they've gone to great expense to have one of these converted. The later model stuff. Whereas I guess they're dime a dozen in the States. You know, the bread and butter type of vehicle, but not, not the case out here. Very expensive to do. The good news is Ford's now bringing them in. I think that started now, hasn't it? As we speak, Ford is actually factory backing the re-engineering, they're calling it, completely removing firewalls and re-engineering them. I've actually seen one already and it's flawless. The conversion on them's flawless. Getting too technical now, Michael. Okay, we get it. Shut up, stop talking. Get that rocket cover off. All right. Come on. I'm trying to help you. Help me. What are you stuck on now? I'm getting angry. Oh, if that didn't catch on every single thing on the way out. And so here's what we found. Number one, it doesn't look that bad. A little bit of grime on the front of the phaser. But the only thing I can see really that is wrong, you see that L there? That should be perfectly lined up with that guy. I've seen them a lot worse where they're a long, long way out, stuck in the full advanced position. That guy is only just off, which doesn't give me any comfort. It doesn't make me think that that's enough to make it not run on this bank. But I'm going to clean up these tangs here, all the way around. I'm going to swap that cam position sensor to that side and vice versa. 
put the coils in and run it run it with the without the cover and see if anything improves on this side if this bank starts running um, and if it doesn't start running we might start checking injectors are getting power I, actually i can tell you how i'll tell if the injectors are getting power yeah that's a mile over full so the injectors are definitely throwing fuel at it when they're not running because that's hard. That oil levels to there should be down there. That's what it smells like. I can't really tell by the smell of it. it. Smells like old oil. So I can't really tell from the oil, but it's over full, so it's got to be full of fuel. And so we'll start by doing what I said. I might change the oil because these are driven um, from oil pressure, so we might see that that snaps back. To the correct position when we change the oil so swap the cam sensors coils back in change the oil and we'll go from there check this out rubber mallet and i just started tapping on that gear and have a look where this is now it's almost perfect it's almost back in line now almost I'll give it a couple more taps, but it's definitely stuck in a locked open position or an advanced position. So, I've changed the oil, coils are back in. Well, I haven't changed the oil yet, I'm still changing it. But, I found something I'm not overly excited about. And I'll chuck this in, then I'll show you. And here's the not so great thing that I found. That's the underside of the rocker cover. Well, that's a, a score mark where I'd say the top of that chain there has actually hit it. So I'm not going to lose my mind over that just yet. Well, I am, but I'm going to tell you that I'm not. Because that chain doesn't look new, but it's 480,000 kilometres. It could have had chains at 300,000 and that's got 180. Is that historical damage is what I'm getting to? Has that been there for a hell of a long time? I was told it had chains in it. It doesn't look like it's had chains. But like I said, what if it was 180,000 kilometers ago that it had chains? That would be consistent. They're not bad. I, I just don't think they look bad enough to be the original chains. At 480,000, if it hadn't had cam chains done, those tensioners would be flogged out. Let's just put the oil lid on it and run it and see what happens. I've lost nothing by doing that. If we end up, it has jumped a cog, a, a, a tooth, then we'll just fix it. We'll just take the timing set off, re-time it, maybe put some new chains in it and then find out it's got a big end knock. No, I don't know. Anyway, let's just keep going. Well, that ran a lot better, but you could actually hear it popping back through the, I was going to say the carving, through the throttle body. So why is it popping back through that? Lots of oil everywhere though, that's a good sign, it's got oil. None of the rockers are loose, so there's no bent valves or anything like that. Nothing left to do but run it again.
make sure I plugged everything in. <laughs> yeah, make sure you plugged in everything now after you've run it, you idiot. No, no, you know what I mean. But I haven't missed anything. I did find this little issue. Oh, that's coolant. I don't know where it's coming from. Ignore the oil. I know where that's coming from. Cam phaser. That's only the oil flicking from the cam phaser just running down, but where's that coolant coming from? It drained that almost instantly. I'll go and look at the bottom of that pipe. And that coolant, I don't know if you can see it down there, but there's a vent right there. It's pouring out that. Which means the heater hose is running into the cab. It's leaking internally. And then that's like the air con vent. So it's pouring out the air con vent. So something's wrong with the heater. So for now, I'm going to cut that hose there as it goes into the cab. I'm going to loop it back over and put him on here. And at least then I can run it without all of that coolant ending up in the cab. So I just cut that hose off there and I've pulled it back to this side and went... There's a join! I'd say when it was converted, they've had to reroute it and they put that join right behind the airbox where I didn't see it. Anyway, no big deal. No, no big deal. Idiot. Anyway, I didn't expect the join to be there so I just cut it somewhere it was easy to get to. So did they. Well, maybe not. They cut it somewhere it was hard for me to see. But it's still a better result than what I thought it could have been. I saw coolant running out the back of the engine there, or around about the back of the engine. I'm just thinking, crack block, blown head gasket, all those fun things. Nope, just the heater hose. Well, I'd say it's internal in the heater core, which is up under the dash, which being converted truck, you can imagine that's going to be pretty straightforward. Anyway, okay, so that's my water leak fixed. And my new bonnet prop, because the bonnet wants to keep coming down on me. Um, so we're not going to leak water now, hopefully. The last time I ran it to find the coolant leak, it wasn't backfiring back through the throttle body again. So maybe it was sticking valves. has been parked for a little while. Anyway, I'll just give it a run. just one cylinder down it's a couple of cylinders still down that chain doesn't seem loose not loose enough to jump like it doesn't seem loose at all that phases out again it's moved again so that means it's stuck again so I'm standing back having a think going this doesn't seem right it's got no play whatsoever in that chain and then the more you think about it the more you think the tensioner is on that side so if the tension is working these teeth are going to hold the tension onto it but what about this side i don't know if you can see that but that that has absolutely positively got enough slack to jump a tooth in actual fact i could almost jump a tooth back look at that we just know we need a timing set. One of the tensioners down the bottom is obviously going to be broken. That's rat out, cover off, front timing cover and that off, and just put a timing set in it. So, yeah, simple as that. Just put a timing set in it. Anyway, let's stop talking. Okay, so that was way too easy. I jumped that chain across. Um, one tooth. I ran it. Ran no different still was missing cylinders here I just started pulling coil leads to find out what was running and what wasn't and this guy here number what's he number five he wasn't firing but then I've jammed a plug up the end of him 
and it was spark everywhere. So we've got spark, we had a sump full of fuel, so we've got fuel, it can only be cam timing from that guy there. So let's stop dicking about and start removing all of this and get into that and get this timing cover off and uh, start putting some chains and phases in him. So that was a bit of a job and now with the timing case laid back like that you can actually see what's happened in here and the power steering pump was probably the most difficult bit to get around I ended up having to buy a tool to get the pulley off that guy but look at this chain that's part of the guide That is also part of the guide. Is it any wonder it jumped a tooth or two? That's just about out. It may have even snapped the end off that from flogging around in there. And that's why it felt tensioned on the top. That side of the chain is okay. And it's no better on this side. In actual fact, there's a fair bit missing of that one. So I'd say I have to go fishing once this reluctant wheel I guess once we remove that you can actually get down to the front of the sump there and I'll have to go digging I would say anyway you can see it needs chains we're going to take the phases off I'm going to lock them out and do the chains and tensioners and guides and just make sure that it's going to run then I'll worry about new phases. So first thing in the morning, I reckon it will be clean up that timing case, go fishing in the sump for other pieces of timing chain tensioner, um, and just make sure there's no debris left in there. And then we'll start into removing the cam phases, locking them out. As I say, I'm gonna lock them out for the time being. Um, that will bring up a check engine light when it runs, but I just wanna check everything else. It's 400,000 plus Ks. If I can get it to run okay with locked out phases, then I'll just buy new phases. It, it's, an, it's an easy job. The cover doesn't have to come back off. You can do it with the rocket covers off and that's it. Or you could just leave them locked out and ignore the check engine light, whatever. But the one thing I'll say with this guy is even when we fire it up, it's been sitting a long time. So there's always that evaporated fuel in the injectors or lines or something like that that it might not run perfectly. But one step at a time, we won't overthink it. Anyway, I'll see you in the morning. So here's where we're starting. I want to crack the cam phaser bolts while the chains are still on just so there's a bit more resistance. But to hold the cam and the motor from rolling over, I've got two sets of vice grips. One here, if see there's the cam lobe. That's in between the cam on the casting, and then there's another load. So I haven't touched the lobes. I've got one there that's resting on the shock tower, there. And I've got that guy up here that's resting against uh, the fuel rail. Basically, so it can't go either way. It can't go left or it can't go right. And I've done the same on the other side. These ones are a little easier to see. There's one 
nice grip there and he's resting up against the inner guard and that guy there is resting against the fuel rail so that'll stop the cam from turning that way or that way once I crack that bolt and once those chains are gone once I've got that cracked I'm going to leave the phaser and remove the chains and the what's left of the guide and the bottom cog then we'll go fishing for pieces in the sump for the rest of the tensioners and replace this guy not because of the chain wear on it because that's a standard oil oil pump and I've bought a melling high volume so we're going to stick that guy in for a little bit extra oil pressure and if you remember we need to address this hole here and that I'll figure it out when I get there because I'll, I'll have to get in there and see exactly how bad that um, that hole is knocked about and whether there's still a piece of bolt in there. Here anyway, I'll stop talking, we'll crack these, get those chains off. Oh, I don't know if you just saw that, but I cracked that and that whole phaser is just coming apart. I might be uh, ordering new phases here after all. There you go, you see that one again? As it cracked it, the whole phaser body moved. Not the phaser body, the section of the front there. What would you say, the reluctor wheel on the phaser? It's all over the shop. I'm not much of a late model kind of guy, so I never thought I'd be doing chain tensioners on here. But I just want to try something a bit new. That was a very loud bird. I just wanted to try something a bit different. See if I could fix it. Because I guess they out here, no one really knows much about these. Ugh. Very uncommon motor. As opposed to in the States. But they're everywhere. That's what I might do. I might just mark that cam shaft, a uh, crankshaft. No, I don't have to. It's keyway, you idiot. You don't have to. You can only go on the one way. There's a different front to back though. I'll put a dot on the front. Or maybe it's only got a dot on the front. I like learning new shit, but it sometimes makes me second guess myself. Yep, yeah, so it's only got a dot on the front. It's got a keyway, so I don't need to mark anything on that. And that can come off. We're getting there. And kind of hard to get you down into the bottom of that engine bay, but with the chains off, the oil pump can come out, and I could get to the head of that broken bolt, drill it out, and then just tap a new thread. Slow process, but in we go. And I've just marked my tap there. You'll see a pink mark come around how far I've got to go in. Because believe it or not, behind that hole is a crank cow weight. Just there. That's it. Anyway, keep going in. That was one thing else I forgot to tell you. I put a dob of grease on the bit, and if you can see why there, it's collected basically every bit of shaving on the, on the uh, tap rather than in the sump in this case. I've got a rag sitting in the bottom of the sump. That hole actually goes through, um, completely through the block and it comes out at the counterweight. How do I know that? Trust me, I just did, because I looked. And if I wriggle the counterweight now, you can actually feel that is right through so the best bit is I can, I can any shavings I can get from the front of the pan because it's open there but yeah that's a good idea a little bit of grease just grabs it stop talking so in with my new bolt and you want to lube up the thread and again I've just marked how far we're going to go in so I'm going to go right in and make sure he's clean yeah, that's pretty good. It's going all the way in by finger. I thought I might have to get a socket onto that. That's the difference between going and buying a good tap or using those Chinese crappy ones to a sit a 40 piece set as opposed to if you just need one, go in and get one. The proper one. 
Oh no, that's going to go in all the way. I'd prefer to pay 20 bucks for one die and it go in and out like that than to fight with a cheap one and stuff around all day, which I have anyway. And now, of course, I have to do the unspeakable. And that is, drill a brand new part. Ever so... Ever so gently. Oh, that wasn't so bad. It just needed just the edge taken off it. Because that bolt is bigger. So there we go. Pump is back in, hole is drilled out, re-threaded, ready for the the um, tensioners to go back in. I have slid the gear back on and I guess I chuck that gear on now because we know because we know nothing's moved up here. We're still locked out with those vice grips on the cam. So essentially now we're ready to knock these phases off um, and get stuck into them. However, I'm going to sit down and work out the torque spec of that oil pump. I haven't, haven't done that yet, but I think it's beer time. I think we've done enough today. Being in that engine bay, I'm finding oil everywhere and yes I will clean that engine bay up but I want to get that timing case on there first and it's definitely beer time I did find out the torque spec it was only 89 inch pounds so I have torqued that down it didn't seem enough 89 inch pounds but I guess if you think of it that oil pump if it's got really fine tolerances you start twisting on it too much and you might actually close those tolerances up so I'm someone smarter than me has worked that out so I'm just going to leave it at what they say and that was one of those days where you felt like you were chasing your tail. But when you think about it, what are you going to do? You've got to do one thing at a time. I can't put that pump in without fixing that bolt. We now know that we've got a good thread, um, a bigger bolt to hold it in. So I'll be able to get a torque spec on that. The one thing I'm not excited about, and I guess we'll find out tomorrow, is when I crack those bolts on the phases, the reluctor wheel on the front seemed to move a hell of a long way. And I, I don't think that should be the case. So I'm wondering if the pins inside the, the phaser itself are actually snapped off, but I guess we'll find that out when we get them out. It's well past beer time, so I'm pulling up at that today. It's only two bolts to get those phasers out, but well, I think my head's had enough today. All right, that was a job and a half, but like I said, we're one step closer. Cheap truck or expensive repairs? I don't know, at the, at the minute, we're still going okay. We've got chains and a few other things, but more time than anything. Anyway, I'll see you in the morning. Okay, you got me. I was a little lie, I said see you in the morning. And I couldn't leave one of these. I've got to check one of these phases. I won't be able to, won't be able to sleep. And I'd say that just come apart completely. My brain plays terrible tricks on me like that. I got to know. But that just looks like it's falling apart. That um, that reluctor wheel is just about off that phaser. It's still beer time, I might add, but I'm just going to do one more thing. Bolt looks fine. I think they're a torque to yield bolt too, so that reluctor wheel is ready to explode. My fingers are going to get hacked here. Wait. I don't know if you can see that far down. Look at that. So there's three pins. Oh, I can get rid of the welding gloves now. So there's three pins. One, two, three. And guess what? They're not there anymore. That is supposed to stay part of that. Well, I guess that answers my question. Let's see if I can get that off. See, it worries me there's that much movement in that too because there's a locating dowel and if it's flogged around, it can actually damage the cam. So we'll see where we end up here. I 
the dowel's really good. Uh, it's not worn. That cam looks good. You know, good enough for me. But this, that's classic phaser failure. Yeah, one, two, three, all sheared off. Crazy. If I'm locking them out, I could probably. Uh, how about I don't lock them out and we just buy new ones? How about that? I'll see about new ones. Alright. See you in the morning. So here's where we're up to. It's now several days later. I had to go back to work, but I used the time to my favour and I messaged, emailed and called pretty much everywhere I could to try and get cam phases. And that's kind of made up my mind. I can't get them. They're telling me things like out of stock and back order. Well, I don't do weight well and I definitely don't speak back order. So we're just gonna fix this now. Locking them out is not the issue here. I've already taken these, I've already loosened these bolts. And this is the back of the cam phaser. And you just take four out, leave one loose, and slide the backing plate to a side. Now there is going to be a, a piece jump. Lock the table in, Michael, it's going to roll away. Like I was saying, there's going to be a plunger that tries to jump out here at me. And if I lose it, it doesn't actually matter now because the phase is not going to be operational. That's hitting on the cam pin. And now it's not. And there's the little plunger. Oh, and the spring. I will put them back in for no reason other than my own peace of mind. However, they actually won't play any role at all now because we're going to lock them out with these little blocks. If you see that section there, it's basically the same shape. And those little blocks, although an incredibly tight fit, they will slide in. Yeah, that phaser is shot. Those fins are just about cactus. Anyway, this will fix it. But that's not the main issue here. We can lock them out, no problem at all. But the reluctor ring has snapped those three little pins. See those three tiny little pins? And they are too, they're only tiny, and that's why it's snapped off. But I've got little nails that I'm going to put in those pinholes line my reluctor wheel up and then weld that reluctor wheel on so it's basically one unit it's no longer a cam phaser it's just a cam gear and then i'll just pull the nails out of the center sounds easy so let's get into that right i'll grow i'll lock them out at the back then i'll grind this up or weld them out. we'll start with a lockout so these little aluminium blocks are essentially the same shape as that slot there and one of them slid straight in so I'll test them all and yeah I'm using two you, you generally only need one but I'm just trying to balance it up so if I get one in there oh well yeah like that <clears throat> I'm gonna put one on the other side that's just my head playing tricks on me you don't need to do that I'm going to have to get the file on that one to get him in. He is so close. Got that file. Oh, I so want to just hit it with the hammer. But I won't. That would be the wrong thing to do, Michael. It puzzles me how they fit in one and not in the other. Oh, I'm just going to give it a little tap, right? Just a little. No. Now I won't be able to get it back out. Good one, Mike. What to do with my file? Calling in the big guns. Got a bit coarser. I'll flick this till I can never find it again, I'll guarantee it. So 
safety first, third and fifth. Oh, I'm taking a punt. Now I'll never get it out. It's still catching on that same corner. So I can't actually believe that was so different from there to there. But I finally got to go in. So, put him back together. I'm just going to whack that in the vise so I can torque them in properly and then we'll get onto the other side by the other side I mean the other side of the phaser and whack that reluctor on so see that's just obviously a steel cover and that's steel as well so I'm just going to clean up around the base of that clean up around the top of that line up those pins and weld him So all I'm going to do now is you can actually see the old pins have actually snapped off but they're still in there. And I can insert a tiny little nail into the top of the pin. Like so. And the head of that nail is smaller than the hole in that reluctor. Is that even the right word? Reluctor? I don't know. Whatever. Thank you. So I'm going to put all three of them in. Just line him up like that. Right, three nails. So now, that can only go on in the correct direction. So the plan is now, let that cool. I'm just gonna let it cool by itself. I'm gonna pull those nails out first of all. And then we're just gonna spin it and just make sure that, that that is perfectly straight, that reluctor there. It's not um, on the piece. So I clamped it down so it looks very good. I'll just give him a measure. Oh, that's good enough for me. That's good enough for me. I don't think I'll spin it. But I will tell you, that's gonna be really hot. The nails out. Done. Let's get them on. And so while this cam gear is still incredibly warm, wrong side, this side Michael. I'm just going to fit him on because if it's heated up, it's expanded and I can tell you, it's still pretty warm. So warm in fact. Damn, Jesus. Let me get some gloves. And we'll have to torque them down. They torque to yield as well. Second thing I shouldn't be doing after locking them out and after welding them is is reusing those bolts they probably should be new bolts because they're torqued to yield but let's just get it running and worry about that shit afterwards phases are back on and torqued down chains are on guides are in and the tensioners are in also now you'll see the two colored links up here and the l well it's the same on the other side except in reverse I've painted a little R there, but there's a locator dot there, and the L's down here. Some of the phases will actually have an R there, and that's why I've sort of given myself the cheat sheet and just put the R there in case. And then you just line those two colored links up with down the bottom, there is a point. I'll see if I can get down there. 
can see just here there's a dot and there's a single colored link you line those two up so the single link at the bottom to the dot and up the top there's the the, the mark with the two links and then you just take the tension out of the top chain line your cam up and the vice grip trick is a bit of a cheat sheet or a redneck way to do it generally they say to take all the valve train off i'm not doing that if you've got two vice grips on one there one the other side you can adjust it i can actually remove them now you can just pinch with one roll with the other just so you're rolling it not losing your camshaft and what i mean by losing your camshaft is the valve springs and lifters because there's pressure on those lobes if you had nothing holding it it'd want to roll over as soon as you take the chain off just so you can hold one vice grip move the other vice grip roll the cam a little if you need to and that way you get your timing right without taking all your valve train off oh i'll tell you actually the next thing we have to do before i worry about that timing case is before i put too much more on the front of the engine i want to knock the plugs out the plugs in these are renowned for snapping off and when the covers and all that are, are on it's really hard to get at so while i got it this far pulled down i'm gonna knock those plugs out and put some new plugs in however i'll go out on a limb and say with the k's or miles that are on this truck i would say it's already had a set of plugs so hopefully if somebody's done them the right way and put a bit of anti seize on the plug i won't have any trouble at all and yesterday I filled those plug holes with WD, so hopefully that's soaked in and we just crack them and knock them out. But we'll see. Yeah, that one came. That was probably the dumbest thing I've ever said. Oh, they'll come out easy. Then snap, snap. We'll see. Just because I've got one undone doesn't mean they're all going to come undone. I don't know if they do have any seeds on them. Yeah, they got something on them. Anyway, smothered in WD. But uh, I'll knock the others out. The one thing I will remind you to do though, is pull these little pins on your tensioners to take up the slack. I wonder if anyone's ever done this job and forgot to do that. Fired up, heard a chatter and... Ugh. So that's probably it for today. It's beer time for sure. And that was kind of a full day wrenching on that thing. And I'm filthy, it's hot. I'm whinging, I'm whining. No, seriously, you're working a little bit slower and more modern stuff, well, I do anyway, because you're always worried about, although you have your list of how it came apart and you're just working backwards, you're worried you're going to miss something so i do tend to pull up just check especially with that timing case going back on there's now plugs and sensors that need to be plugged back in and one thing i've never done is give a shout out to anyone else but there's a channel in the states called ford tech make your loco it's a guy named brian i don't know him he doesn't know me but he's the absolute jedi knight of these things and i must admit i had his video going in the background at one stage just to get torque sequence correct on that timing case and of course the torque specs there's a lot of bolts there and i laid them all out as you saw and, and you just don't want to stuff up there's just so many little things the only way you could stuff up your list is if you didn't write something down as you removed it 
I guess you could stuff it up that way. But if you, you only got to take the, the power steering pump, for example. I wanted to unbolt the pump, but to get the bolts out for the pump, I'd take the line off. To get the line off, I had to take the pulley off. So the pulley had to come off to get to the line, to get to the bolt, to remove the pump, to take the timing cover off. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, that's it. Crazy. But anyway, all that shit aside, it's done now. And that's one thing. I do try to treat it as a heap of little jobs. Just get one thing done, timing cover on. Plugs next, plugs done. Spill shit all over yourself, whatever. Try and treat it as a heap of little jobs, not one big job. Just fit the timing cover, cross it off, move on. Fit your plugs, move on, that sort of thing. And it doesn't get quite so overwhelming. It is a big job, it's a huge job actually. But anyway, be worth it. Anyhow, first thing in the morning, we'll start on the rocker covers. Um, I can't even think what else, to be honest. It's way past beer time. Yep, can't think. That'll do. See you in the morning. Okay, so I spared you having to watch me put it all back together. But it basically was just following my list. So once the air conditioning compressor had turned up and was fitted, it was just belts, fan, shroud, radiator, and just bolt everything up. So we're now at the point where we can fire everything up. I've checked a few fluids. The only thing I haven't done up is the receiver dryer. I've got a new one coming to go with the new air conditioning compressor, um, but that won't stop us firing it up. So I'll leave that till after. Let's give it a hit. Just checking I haven't missed anything because that was a lot. And I mean, that was in around other jobs as well. So that wasn't, you know, I stopped, started, waited for that compressor and, and a tool for that power steering pulley puller. So anyway, let's hit her. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. Not even a kick. What the hell? That doesn't make sense. That makes no sense. None. So, due to technical difficulties, the next two to three hours, we have no footage of. Yeah, technical difficulties. No, but seriously, once I gathered my shit up and stopped chucking a tantrum, I invented a few words and then calmed down and started to break it down, find out what was going on, because honestly, that didn't make sense. The not starting issue in my head was completely unrelated to the timing chains and everything else we've done. Unless, of course, I've left the cable off or something like that, which that was the first place I started and I have got it sorted now. I'll show you what I found. Actually, I'll show you the process of finding what I found because it was actually kind of intriguing painful but intriguing let's have a look so the first thing I was looking at and thinking of is cables is the battery connected is the starter connected I didn't actually disconnect the, the starter so that wasn't to be an issue but we've had the PCM out and we've had the, the battery out so I'm wondering did they need to relearn did they need to be plugged in for longer reset maybe so I thought I'll start with basics. I disconnected the battery, joined the terminals together. That would reset the PCM. I checked the, con the connection of the PCM, which you can't really get that wrong because I've got those locking strips, but checked it anyway. And the next thing is climb under and check the starter motor. Just make sure it hadn't failed. So this is probably a little hard to see, but there's your starter. There's your constant power to the starter. And that little guy there, this fella here, is your activation wire. So this guy will have constant power. And I checked power there and he has got power. And this guy, when you turn the key into the crank position, that will get power to activate the starter. That is getting no power whatsoever in the crank position. So something's not sending power to that wire. But the way to test the starter is get a screwdriver and touch that terminal and that terminal together. Bear in mind, it'll try and engage the starters. And you will shit your pants and jump, but just 
bridged the two out and I tested that starter and it is engaging. So something's not sending signal to that wire. So after we've tested the starter, you start thinking, well, modern cars have got a lot of tech in them, like transponder keys and computers and that sort of thing. And your head starts running away with electrical wizardry because that doesn't look like the original key. It's not. And that barrel doesn't look that great. So we're thinking about keys and computers and things like that. But if you actually slow down and think about it, which it took me a while to calm the hell down, there's ways to check is the key communicating with the car, is the PCM communicating with the wiring, the ignition. It probably differs a lot with different cars, but the way to tell if the key is communicating with one of these F-150s is see the PAT system light or the smart lock or whatever you want to call it. See that light flashing there? As I roll the key on, see it? It becomes solid and then goes out. Stop beeping. But that'll tell you that the key is being recognized by the PAT system. So that's communicating. It's not that key, even though as sketchy as that lock barrel and that key looks, it's not the key. The next one I guess I'm thinking was, was it reading um, that the, the computer was in place? And that's an easy one. These guys will actually tell you when they're unplugged, they will actually tell you where it says door ajar there to actually come up there and tell you that the PCM is not being read well, there's no connection. The other way to tell is find the fuse box because if the PCM's reading or, or getting voltage sent to it, you'll hear clicking at the fuse box with relays and, and, and that sort of thing. Ignition relays, starter relays. So to find the fuse box. So if you're from the States, you're saying it's on the driver's side down there. But hang on, it's not the driver's side. And all that's been modified. It's actually under the driver's feet at the back there. The fuse box on this converted truck is right there. So I can actually put my hand on those relays and turn the key up above and I can feel them clicking. And the ones we want to look at is this guy here. That's a starter fuse, that's a PCM fuse and that top relay on the left hand side is also a starter relay. But they're all working they're all clicking, you can hear them clicking. I can actually hear another one down the back, like it's a fuel cutoff solenoid or something. It's clicking as well. So you know, after swapping a few relays around, just in case they look good or you, you think you can hear them clicking and it's not the, the correct one. I swapped a couple round, PCM's connected, keys working. It's like, what else could it be? I tried to start it in park. I tried to start it in neutral. And that's when it dawned on me. When I reversed this back into position to start work on it, that shifter was really hard to move. The button was stuck in and the shifter was really hard to move. But look, so I've tried to start it in park and neutral, but take a look at this. So this is gonna be an extreme close up but there's the shifter linkage right there that's the that's the cable and that's the the arm on the transmission and if i get you over here and give you a better look at this so if we pull the shifter into into park and then back into low you see absolutely nothing happens and so essentially what's happened is i've reversed it in here it wasn't yesterday it was a little while ago, so I, I, I forgot that that felt different. And when I put it into park, the last time I broke the shifter. I, I haven't pulled it apart yet to find out what's broken, but it's literally just not moving underneath the car. The upside of that is, if I manually put it in park, this should start.
sounds of it, that now steering pump still wants a little bit more fluid. But I'm not hearing any ticking, any chattering. A little bit of smoke. But I'm not real concerned about the smoke just yet because think of how many times that was wound over with cylinders that weren't firing because of those phases in the wrong position. Think of the amount of fuel it would have had. So it might smoke for a little while, but I'm just going to let him idle, let him learn. I've got nothing on the dash. I've got an engine light, but that doesn't surprise me, and I'll explain why. Before I start trying to explain that, put a bit more. So that's quite and right down. So essentially all it is is if there's air inside those power steering pumps, they're gonna groan and whine and carry on. I've now got that basically full and it's settled right down. So I'm just gonna let it sit and do its thing for a little while. We'll probably end up topping up the water level as well. And as long as I've got no leaks, I'll put cooling in. Oh no, actually I won't put cooling in it because if you remember, it was leaking in the heater core so we're still going to pull that out but i'll worry about that after so i'll get over here where you can hear me and i'm just going to let it idle away just just get some temperature into it see if we've got any leaks anything like that and to explain that engine light that's going to be from those cam phases see that the cam phaser solenoids now would be wigging out they'd basically be trying to, to control or vary the timing it can't be done so that's where my engine light's going to come from. You can have that tuned out of the PCM. You can get a flash, um, like a SCT flash tuner and take that out. And that's probably what I'll do if it's doing everything correct. Because as I said, I can't get those phases anytime soon. I've fired up a lot of old cars, but I can tell you that was about the most anxious I've ever been trying to fire something up. Late model, a little bit of electronic wizardry there. And that was a lot of work too. That was a hell of a lot. It's not like, but I could have pulled an old motor out five or six times in the time it took me to do those chains and get all that back together. But she's idling now, it sounds good, it's not rattling, it seems to be doing everything right. I'm just gonna let her get rid of that smoke. And as I said, if you couldn't hear me from the exhaust was right in front of me there, that'd be we were whining on that a lot, trying to get it to fire and run, and somebody else had been in there, so they'd probably done exactly the same. And there'd be a lot of fuel getting injected into cylinders that wasn't getting burnt. The cam phases had come apart that bad. If you saw that reluctor wheel was spun that bad, it would have been trying to fire at completely the wrong time, not burning anything. And that's probably the result, a little bit of unburnt fuel inside those cylinders. Hopefully a good run will settle that down. But, that's running. Let's pull that shifter apart and see if we can't get it to drive. It's nowhere near beer time, but I feel like cracking one. That's just a weight off my mind. Maybe later. Righto, let's get into it. So, good. so that's a solid 45 minutes idling and oh, ever so slight we still got our little little whiff of maybe that's only steam now not necessarily smoke it doesn't look as blue but anyway I think it's time to stop talking shut him down 
I may be start looking at why this shifter has failed. So to pull the console out, it looks like I'm going to have to go in through the base. There's bolts there. And the shifter I half started to pull apart in the diagnosing process because I was thinking, is it just not shifting up here? What's going on? All that came apart pretty easy. Just by prying those little clips at the bottom and lifting up. Like that. But even that's stuck that's why the button wasn't working so all right uh, let's try and get this out see what's going on under there nope turns out you don't go in this way although it's handy now that covers off because i really want to clean it it's absolutely putrid but i started trying to lift this and it felt like it was anchored underneath the front section and it is so the front section come off first so i don't need to take the rear section off anyway check that out The seats have just slid down, down through there and in around the shifter. Oh, there we go. There it is right there. It's literally just broken that eyelet. How am I going to, how am I going to get that to stay on there? That looks broken inside. Hmm. I guess I'll work that one out. There's more to it though, because this isn't this button isn't working. So I think I want to remove the whole thing and and start from scratch. I think. So I got the shifter out, and it's quite free, but it doesn't doesn't help that that's not working. So I'll I will pull that apart and find out why that that button is no longer working. But the real issue is the cable. It's very stiff, so I've just got a bit of tape. And I've wrapped it around the cable to the point where the cable goes inside the casing. Just made a little bit of a funnel. Now I'm going to dribble some WD into that. If I can get it in there. And yeah, it's going to leak out around the tape. But if it pulls up like that, hopefully a bit will run down that tape into that cable. And the rest will just be gravity. I'll do that three or four times and just keep working that cable in and out. If it doesn't free up, I guess we're getting a new cable. So I've got the shifter apart, basically. Here's what I'm finding. I've got the button to work. That little section there has a spring in the top. So when it gets pushed down, the button comes out. So that bit's fine and all that's gonna work fine. But the problem actually lies with this bit here that's some sort of safety switch i think because if you take that out there's a little switch there so if i put that back in like that so i would say when you push your foot on the brake electronically that drops down which allows that to flip back and switch that switch on stupid switches i wonder if that's just fallen over and got caught in there all right so here's an idea this all the safety shit off. If I can knock that pin off, I can take that, that out of there. If I put the spring back in there so that pops open. It works fine. I would say that little safety bit that was in there, that now isn't, wasn't being activated. I think that's the bit that depresses when you put your foot on the brake. It depresses, but it wasn't depressing. That's why it was locked up. And I'd say that's how it started. Maybe somebody's pulled on it too hard, damaged the cable, I don't know. Anyway, if I put the spring and that thing back together, I'd almost say that's Gonna work fine i just need a nice heavy spring in the top there without the safety switch of course but you still have to pull the button in so it's not like it's going to jump out of gear don't don't care it's going back in that's going to come back off so i've got my shifter going back in and all the mechanism's going to work just fine now 
is it? Is it really? Yes, it is. But that hasn't fixed this guy wanting to jump off. If you pull hard enough, you can pop that off. And that's long term, it's not going to work. So I'm going to drill a tiny little hole in the top of this arm here and a tiny little hole in the bottom of that arm there. And I'm going to run a zip tie straight down through there, around the back of the cable and pull those two together like that. And that'll do until I order a new cable. And then once the new cable arrives, let's just lift that guy back off. I can get to everything there. Yeah, sure. Once a new cable gets here. So we're almost back together. And you can see my button's working now because there's a little spring that goes down inside there that depresses that, that lever down, which activates that button. But it's normally held in there and there's two little clips. Well, there used to be. Now there's one clip and it's broken. So you can see somebody's had a go at gluing it on. I've made a little circlip. I pierced a little hole there a little hole there so I'm now just going to snip off the edge there and leave that little clip in there you know makeshift kind of circlip there we go and so that's going to hold that spring in you can see the spring there can't get out and then our little cap we'll just go sit back on top there we go Working shifter. Right, uh, you know what that means though. I've got no air con. Oh, at least both the windows work. I might put the back down too. And the roof, does it work? Ah. Oh. Now we're cranking. And like I said, we've got an engine light, but I'm not concerned about that. I'm more concerned about. Oop. Started to freak out. I thought we had no gears. Hey, Tomo. What's it telling me? Fail safe mode. Engine failsafe mode. Still sounds fine though. Maybe, maybe it's doing that now because of those locked out phases. Don't care. It's driving. And that's enough dicking about let's have some fun let's get some shit on this thing make it a bit cool let's rip in and I'll look into that fail safe mode a bit further and maybe do some shit about this so why I say we're gonna have a little fun is I'm done with the serious shit for a little bit I backed myself a little bit and bought some parts that I wanted to throw at it knowing full well I eventually would get it going whether it took a full motor or not but we've got some things it needs like keypads some new mirrors for the side because they're both broken and of course a leather wrap for the steering wheel because this one is absolutely garbage just falling off so I'm literally going to cut all that off and start fresh with that Maybe build that section up with some wrap or something first and then try and rewrap the steering wheel. Obviously a real good clean, but the fun bit is I've got some strut spaces to level up this front. If you see at the back, he's got quite a bit of distance there, but at the front there's nowhere near the same distance. I'd have to say maybe 200 mil versus about 140 I don't really, really care exactly what it is although maybe I should measure it so we know exactly what we get out of these spaces 
And these go on top of the strut. They literally, you just bolt the strut to that and then more bolts down through the top up underneath the wheel arch. Just under there, so we're going to lift the front suspension, unbolt that strut, try and drop it down, place a spacer on top and then put him back in. And hopefully that'll just level us up a bit, just lift that front a fraction. I'm not looking to lift the thing high into the sky, but just even that gap up a little bit. Last but not least, is I've got another grill for it. A black grill because I because I find these guys are a little bit dated now we'll replace that guy and probably remove that one and paint it black to match I guess we'll try and tidy up those headlights as well but anyway just some small stuff just to make them a bit cooler but anyway let's stop talking we'll get into these strut spaces so these are the little spaces I'm going to use and all they are is a block of aluminium. That's a 25 millimeter spacer. And I actually don't mind them. I've put these in a few vehicles and I think I like them because they don't actually change anything. They don't change your spring rate. They don't change your shock or how it reacts. All they're essentially doing is moving the mounting point of the factory strut lower because that goes in between the mounting point and the strut. So it just pushes everything down. And being 25 mil won't give you 25 mil lift or level or actually even more, because of the lower control arm will pivot in an arc, this guy sitting on top of the strut will probably give us more like 40 mil. Anyway, I'll tighten these up and we'll get over here and I'll show you how it goes in. So essentially this spacer goes on top of that strut there. So I've undone the top of the strut there and he's ready to start dropping down. I've started to undo this guy here and I will crack that joint. And that will allow all of this to swing down and pop the strut out. There's a couple of bolts here and a sway bar that I've undone here. And I'm just going to swing that completely away and take that strut out. To get it out, I might not need spring compressors, but going back in, I'm pretty sure I'm going to have to compress it and go in because of the extra height that we're going to put on top of him there. But yeah, I'll knock a couple of bolts out and we'll get him out. I'm just going to try and heat this um, arm, I can't think what it's called, it's getting late. Just so I can knock that joint off and then I can flip that um, top control arm out of the way. But I'm not replacing that ball joint so I'm going to come from the bottom and try to keep it intact and not burnt. And sometimes you can get them to release. Oh, get out from under me. Sometimes you can get them to release just by hitting on that side there, so. Oh, really? It's supposed to look like a bit of a struggle. Anyway, I shouldn't complain. They don't usually come apart that easy. Next, we'll knock that big bolt out down the bottom of the strut and see if we can't swing that out of the way and just pop him out. Now, who can tell me what that's gonna be? Every episode. I want to grab it right now. I honestly do. I don't want to do this. I want to flick it. Ah. Uh. Got it. Sucker for punishment. I'll probably sit on it now. Because I wasn't close. I mean, I wasn't far away. Alright, so we get this big bastard out. <laughs> Just touch that. That steering arm's kind of holding that, so there's no pressure on those lines yet. Which is good. Don't really want pressure on those lines. That can hold that up there. Like that. Crack this big trigger. So I've compressed the spring down and you're just sitting the spacer on top like that. 
and then we're going to use the factory nuts to secure the spacer. And then we're going to have to let the spring compressors off the back one first so I can get him into the I guess into the position there and we'll see where we go I might be able to back them off wiggle them around but anyway in we go there he is so if I can now get a nut on it before I blow some sort of valve Holding it up there. Get out of the way. Oh, I've got one. Just as I dropped it. Got one on. We'll put all three on. And we're not we're not far off this bottom eyelid anyway. I'll just leave him in the in the position I think. And then it's beer time. I do like beer time. So there's our strut bolt. In a strut nut on, and those bolts up the top there, they're just on finger tight, but you can do them up after. So I'll get that guy nipped up, we'll do this top ball joint up, and then just start tightening things back up. I have to get the jack and jack that one into it, I think. All right, nearly there. Put my dust cover back in place. Yeah. Get in place. This is no time for games. There you go. That took way too much effort. That's the wrong one again. How many times are we going to do that? The factory ones are 15. The aftermarket ones are 17. Slow learner. So everything's pretty much done up except the top of this strut. Um, Two more to do, we'll pop a wheel on, and then we'll go and settle them in. And then we'll actually see, like I said, it's a 25 mil spacer. Doesn't mean you're gonna get 25 mil, I actually think you're gonna get a lot more. I'll have a guess and say 40. I'll try and set him, I, I did measure it before too. Um, 185 tire to the guard, 135 at the front tire to the guard. So we'll see, we'll be able to tell exactly. It got the better of me, I thought, ah, oh, don't worry about that. Yeah, I've got to sleep at night. This is a big friggin' tyre. Like, big friggin' tyre. 33s. To be exact. Right, uh, we're all back together. I might have a bit of a wash up and... Not that it matters, inside this thing is still filthy, but I'll have a bit of a wash up and we might... Just go for a quick drive, jump on the brakes a few times, just try to settle him in. Then we'll check out what sort of gap we've got front to back but I can tell you even now straight off the jack it looks a lot more even so let's have a little drive and I'll just jump on the brakes a couple of times from throughout here and just see if I can put a bit of pressure on these springs might do it a few times at slow speed first Ooh. I think I can hear those dust boots, I don't think I put them back in correctly. But we'll see what it looks like now. Awesome day, but it is beer time. There's a little bit of a rattle up the front here, which I just think is my shock um, dust cover. 
I don't think I put it back in properly because I was rushing. Anyway, great day. It runs, it drives, it stops, and sounds good. Still got plenty to go tomorrow, cleaning inside. Um, I have decided I'm gonna do something with these wheels. I wanna either dark gray them or black them or something like that. Maybe I'll get the grill in first and then see where we go from there. But I, I don't think I wanna leave them that pale gold type of color. I wanna do something there, but anyway, we're nearly there. I'll see you in the morning. Oh, I nearly forgot to tell you. The height difference, of course, it's, how could you forget that? Well, I just did, all right? So it was 185 tired of the guard, 135 tired of the guard. It is now, and I shit you not, 185, 180. They are five mil different. So that's essentially given us, what's that, 45 mil, I said 40, 45 mil is what we got out of it. So from 135 to 180. Uh, and that's off a 25 mil spacer, so it, it basically almost doubled its height in the spacer. They might still settle, but even if it settled to 170, 175, that's, that looks about as level as I can get it. It's good enough for me, that's for certain, so right, now I'll see you in the morning. So I did a bit of research last night about this fail-safe mode, and it's telling me that cam phaser lockouts probably won't bring it on. So I've gone back to basically try and work out a few of these codes and after resetting the bottom two are gone and I thought I'd start working through these and see what we could clear up. 446 and 443 both refer to the evaporative emission system purge control valve and 155 and 135 are basically O2 sensors. So I'll show you what I found. So I started unplugging and cleaning all the O2 sensors, and yes, they're under the truck, but this is one that I've got down the back of the firewall, and look at that. It looks like it's got awfully hot. Now, I can't see any damage to the wiring, but I thought that would be a good place to start, and the other one, the evaporative emissions control valve is here. It's this little guy. Now, I don't speak emissions, but I kind of now understand what this guy does. That pipe goes to the intake manifold and supplies a small amount of vacuum via this pipe that vents the fuel tank, basically sucking any, any fuel vapor. And that's the control. To test if this guy is sticking open, unplug your power. And then unplug the bottom hose like that and then run the engine and just put your finger over the end if you can feel any sort of vacuum when it's not getting told to open then that's leaking now that's not the case in this one but I tested in there for power whilst it was running and it should be powered up and there was nothing and so I went to my old friend Google and I googled which which fuse was going to be the correct one and it's way up here number 32 and let me just read you what it controls vapor management valve which is that guy um, canister vent AC clutch relay if you remember the AC compressor in this one failed um, oxygen sensors number 11 to 21 whatever CMCV mass airflow sensor Heated positive crankcase ventilation, or PCV, which that kind of is as well. So my point being, both of those O2 sensor codes and that evaporative emissions sensor code, or circuit code, all controlled by the one fuse. And guess what? I don't know how well you can see that. That has got the tiniest little split in it. So I'm not counting my chickens just yet, but I'll replace that, start him up, and just see if those codes disappear and maybe the fail safe goes away. So like I said, they were coming on 
instantaneously before. So I can't imagine why they wouldn't have came on instantaneously this time. Okay, so erased. Unplug. Start. Doesn't sound any different. Why would it? That's missing. We'll go again. Please be no codes. Or well, there'll still be VCT codes, that's for certain. It had eight codes, then I got it down to six codes. That has no codes. No codes. Might run a bit longer, eh? Just to make sure. Actually, I'll, I'll back myself. I'll put that PCM back on the firewall. Well, we'll see if the codes come back up. I didn't even get out of the yard before and it came up into fail-safe mode, so we'll see. Come on, make it round. Don't hit Tomo. I'm going to hit Tomo. Help. You hear a bit of rattling up front, but I think that's only that receiver dryer. I didn't zip tie it or anything. It was already in fail safe mode yesterday. I hadn't even got to here and it was fail safe. What's missing off the dash there? Oh, I don't know. A check engine light's gone out as well. I wonder if the lockouts are going to bring it back on, but that's the least of our concerns. At least we got that fail safe mode off. Work on modern cars, they said. It'll be fun, they said. It has been kind of fun. Speaking of fun, let's get into the fun stuff. Let's get this grill on. Let's get him cleaned up. And that's a bit of a weight off my mind because I was thinking I did need to reprogram that with a tuner or something um, to get rid of the VCT check engine light to then take it out of fail safe but just finding that fuse hey i'm not going to sing the praises of modern cars just yet but that little scan tool did make it very easy to head down the correct path really quickly that didn't take a lot of time but anyway we're, that's probably the most modern car you'll ever see from me and we're back in the 60s next episode so let's get into the fun stuff let's get the grill in um maybe paint these wheels thinking about changing them and then just give it a real good scrub inside. All right, let's get into it.
So that was a bit of a shame it started raining because I was getting a ton of help. But it gave me time to mix up a little bit of wheel silver. I've just added some black to the VB Commodore wheels and I've come up with a let's say a very dark gunmetal grey that I'm going to do the wheels in. I'm a little apprehensive there's a few too many colours going on but I'm not leaving them like that and I don't want to just paint them black. I think sometimes when they're just black they look like all you've done is grabbed a rattle can and just whereas in this dark sort of a gunmetal I think it'll look just fine. Probably match the bottom of that bar once I shine that up, that lower section, maybe the side steps, but it's beer time, but top day. Long day, but top day. The rain sort of slowed us up a little bit on the painting of the wheels, but the whole family's pitched in with the cleaning. I got under it and pressure cleaned it after it started raining. And my boy, he's taken it upon himself, he's still going. He's trying to get that coolant stain if you remember the heater is leaking inside the cab and we bypassed it but there's a bit of a orange coolant stain mark in the carpet well he ain't taking no for an answer he's smashing it anyway tomorrow we'll get the wheels painted when it's dry i hit them with a bit of a sandblaster just to etch the surface and maybe black under the wheel arches and under the truck and that's that's pretty much it in the morning I'll show you how clean my family got that whole interior and I've still got that steering wheel to do as well I still want to wrap that steering wheel and, and stitch some new leather over it but that's it for now I better help him out see you in the morning so this morning before the weather changes mind we'll get some paint on these guys but take a look at how the inside of this come up it was grotty and filthy So a little bit to go on the carpet of this side and we're going to try and wrap that steering wheel today but the dash is a ton better the trims are a lot better but for now i reckon we get some black under these wheel arches and get ready to put these painted wheels on i don't know how much i can really give you about painting wheels other than unless the paint's really bad you don't need to strip the paint off i've just hit that with a a light sandblast just to etch the hard to get to bits and then I've got a bit of scotch bright that I'm going to scuff it down with as well but just to clean with thinners or prep sole or something like that I'm not really too concerned about these there's a little bit of damage on that one behind me and a little bit of paint flaking off there but realistically I've got them I want to keep it cheap and these would be the first things I would replace if I was going to spend any money on this truck at all It'll be different wheels and tyres. And I'm being a complete tight ass. I'm reusing my tape from under my wheel arches to mask up my wheels. Doing it this way, it's called wet on wet, where you put your primer down and then straight over it with your colour, you don't re-sand it. If you're looking for a mint job, the idea of the primer is to fill your imperfection, sand it back out, have it perfect, then put your colour over. I'm not doing it perfect. This is not a perfect job, so we're just going to do it this way, wet on wet. Straight over with your primer, straight over with your colour. So I've just put a second coat on this one, so that should be pretty covered, that should be the, the final colour. And before I go wasting any more paint, just in case, because I'm starting to think is that not dark enough, I'm going to sit up against the car and see how we go. See what it looks like. I think once I give that side step a bit of a shine up, that'll be pretty good actually. One way to tell. Good enough for me. And that's just an acrylic lacquer. 
which by painting standards these days acrylic lac is a little bit old school and dated but I like acrylic lac on little jobs like that two reasons um, it sticks well three reasons three it sticks well it's easy to use and it dries fast easy to touch up too I guess so maybe there's more reasons I just like it all right how fast it dry well that's touch dry now I reckon I'll give that an hour in the Sun and then we'll put them on that's a bit I like about it no mucking about Hell yeah! So the one bit I'm really looking forward to, well, kind of stressing about it more than looking forward to it, but I didn't know what to do with this steering wheel. If you can see up there, it's got quite a bit of damage here. And so I cut all that loose stuff that was off, but this section there really needs to be built up. I didn't just want to use tape or something like that. As tape gets hot inside the car, it tends to get soft and go sticky. So here's what I've thought up. As I say, I didn't want to use tape. I think it'll just come off. So here's what I've cooked up. I've got a leather cover and I'm no seamstress, so I've got to figure out how to stitch that together. But it comes with its own little string and that. But underneath, I think I'm going to use a tennis racket grip. It's the only thing I could think of that was a little bit padded and it's kind of designed to adhere to itself. And then I'll just put the leather wrap over it. So hopefully it's not like tape where it goes soft or starts getting you know you can twist the steering wheel or something like that so we'll see how we go i've got two different styles i've got a slightly padded one or i've got a a thinner flatter one so I'll, I'll see if i can't wrap it around and see where we get from there to start where it dips in and i might have to do two bits so go around there then start again and go back but maybe not Maybe I'll just wind it tighter. It's a fair bit there. Let's see where we go. What's the worst that could happen? Has that got a coating on the outside of it? I'm no seamstress or I'm no sports star either. Work this tennis racket stuff out. And I'm just hoping that leather outer, you know, cover that you stitch on won't slide on that so it won't get, you know, you can twist it. Stop talking, too many words, just just put it on, for God's sake. I think it's actually going to work, what do you know? Look, that wasn't as seamless as I wanted, but I actually think it's going to work when I get the cover on it. So where, where do I want that seam? I'll just put it in the bottom where you don't see, eh? Google is my friend. Oh, it's, look, it's a little bit lumpy there, but now Google is my friend. Figure out what stitch I'm going to use and get that done. Maybe I am a seamstress. Same see. 
So the steering wheel's taken its sweet ass time. However, I think it's coming up all right. That's where I started. Not the greatest stitching, but look, I'm going right now. The only thing I would have done different is, see the gap there? I went a little bit wide with my tennis racket grip repair, so my stitching's a bit mongy there. But I recommend it. That's coming up okay. And I mean, look at the whole steering wheel I got from there to there to go. And all you're doing is looping it through that one. And coming back through the other side. Just like that. Totally worth it. I'd 100% recommend it. Could have done that bit a bit better, but for my first crack, I'm pretty pumped with that. I don't think I've ever done, a, I don't think I've ever had a car with a leather steering wheel before. I'd definitely try it on something a bit old school, but I tend to find with the old school ones, their steering wheel's diameter that way is so much smaller. The cover would be too big, but anyway, that's, that's a whole different episode, I think. So I wasn't going to bore you with this one because I knew it would be pretty full on but if you remember we had a heater hose leak inside and if you look down here you see that grommet there is where that hose went through the firewall and there's a hole I don't even know if I can get you there about there and that's where that hose went through the firewall and so this is where we're up to I'm going to pause for a minute, have a minute silence for the F-150. All the consoles out, most of the dash parts are out. And I was actually quite surprised how easy it was as far as remove the console and then there was only five bolts. One, two, three, and two on the other side. And then just as you lever it back, just start unplugging harness and see where you get. I've got it to there. Um, there's a few tricky bits, I guess, because of the conversion. But when I got in here, and you look at that fitting, that's where the hose was. And if you look opposite the fitting, that's coolant. And if you take a look at the hose, see that there. All of that. A goddamn split hose. I was worried that it was the core and I was going to have to remove all that, but the fact that there's coolant sprayed all over there is pretty much telling me the origin of the leak is at the top here spraying out. So all I've got to do is clean that up, slip another hose on, maybe some sealant, and then put all that back. <laughs> and the only tip I can give you is just label stuff. Where it came from, bag it up. I'm not feeling very production line-ish. But it's going back in. And I've got to say, I did like how the whole thing is one piece. And you can just picture it on the production line, just swings in sits in place and somebody goes zip zip of course the steering wheel's on that side when they do it but i've got one bolt in there now maybe i can jump on that side and swing him back up into place <sighs> oh maybe i am production line ish Just leave him. I've got one bolt in the bottom that side, one bolt in the top this side. And now we're just gonna get under and start plugging shit together. This is the correct posture that you have to have when fitting plugs on the dash. This was a hard one to get undone and an equally hard one to do up. Oh. And if you haven't done anything like this before, this is probably one you're wondering about. That one bolt is all you need so that that column can stay with the dash 
and not be attached to the car. I'll show you. I don't know how well you can see that, but that is a steering knuckle there, and it's got, see that little square? And that one bolt that I've dropped three times goes up through that section there. And if you see, there's the steering shaft right there. I'll just turn the steering wheel so you can see. See it's wiggling? Well, just there, I can't show you. See on that side, oh, I'll just lock the steering column. Oh, that works. No, that works. Leave it like that. Because there's a groove just there. That's where that bolt goes through. So all I've got to do now is get this column and bring it back out because it's collapsible. So it collapses in and then sit it on the end of that shaft. Now it's misaligned right now because I don't have enough hands. But that is the only thing that I had to disconnect, that one bolt, to take that column away from the rest of the steering column and shaft. Just so that the whole dash could come back a little or swing out as I had it without the steering wheel being attached to the rest of that shaft. All back together. And that was a fairly epic job, but no more coolant leak behind the dash running down under that floor. I've got one last thing I want to do. It's a real quick buff and polish. Camera's falling over, wind's picking up, shit's going wrong. I just kicked the shit out of that, can you even see? Looking on those cam phases. Busy, birds. And, really? Really? I didn't really like the... <laughs> I don't have to throw something, I'm going to have to go up there and throw the broom into the tree or something. 
Yeah, I didn't really like that when I was undoing that. You have to be shitting me. Four times. Arms passing a magnet. Still very hot. Still very hot. Stop talking, Michael. Do it. What do you expect, dickhead? When I was taking those. Stupid birds. But anyway, that's probably it from a budget truck or project truck or cheap makeover or whatever you want to call it. And I did enjoy that one. It's a little bit later model than I'm usually used to dealing with. But we're back in the 70s next episode, so I'll see you next time and thanks for watching.